Let's start with a prayer in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are thou most holy, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and here of our death. Amen. Amen. Seat of wisdom, pray for us. Refuge of, refuge of sinners, pray for us. Help of Christians, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Okay. Um, <coughs> I think some background to this uh, in unbelievable, totally believable uh, crisis. It is a crisis of the Society of St. Um Unbelievable because the society seemed so strong. It seemed faithful for many years. It lasted, it has lasted, it's in its 42nd, 43rd year now. And yet, so unbelievable, it was faithful. Then believable, because as I sort of said in the sermon, um, the sa exactly the same disease that caught hold of the mainstream church uh, at Vatican II, exactly the same modern world, exactly the same disease of wanting to go with the world, exactly the same disease of cha adapting the church to the world. Now it's adapting the society to the worldly church in completely in parallel. Uh, so it's completely believable. In that sense, it's completely believable. I think some history of the church so that you can see where we are. We are not at the most glorious moment of church history, obviously. How many of you heard or know anything of the seven ages of the church? A few of you, yes. OK. Well, I have talked. It's something I have talked about before. But it's always precious and it's always interesting. You can see uh, this, this, this paper is vertical. What I really need is a big board and then a great arch going left to right. But in fact, this, la this arch is going to have to go up and down. But that doesn't matter too much. So we have an arch going from Christ. Oh, that's a lovely purple. To the Antichrist. <coughs> and that is the sort of history of the church. Let's, let's present the history of the church as a great arch, like that. And seven ages. These seven ages are come from a commentary by a German priest at the beginning of the, seven, of the 1600s, just about the time, soon after, or during the Thirty Years' War, the terrible Thirty Years' War from 1618 to 1648, which devastated Germany. Um, and the Catholics fought to hold on, to keep Catholic, Germany Catholic, but the Protestants were too well established, and in the end they had to agree, agree to differ. And that was the Peace of Westphalia, in 1848. But he was writing at that time, so it was a time of great chaos uh, in Germany. He was German. And he was writing a commentary on the Book of the Apocalypse, uh, the, f the last book of the, chap of the Bible, which is very, a very mysterious book. And uh, he thought he was inspired. He, he felt an inspiration to write this commentary. And when the inspiration dried up in the beginning of chapter 15, he simply stopped writing because he was no longer had the same inspiration to write. So he thought he was inspired when he wrote this. We're going to look at his commentary just of two chapters, chapter 2 and chapter 3. I don't know how many of you know anything about the book of the Apocalypse, but chapters 2 and 3 are the seven letters to the seven churches of Asia, Smyrna, Pergamum, yeah. uh, La Laodicea, yeah. Philadelphia, and so on. There are seven of them. Sardis, and so on. <clears throat> and he, what he said was, what he felt inspi inspired to say was, it's perfectly possible he was inspired, uh, God revealing, the Holy Ghost revealing secrets down the ages as the church needed them. But this an analysis of the seven ages is very interesting. So he said, the first letter to, I forget which church it is, corresponds to the first age of the church, the second to the second age, and so on. Um, the first age of the church, he reckoned, goes from 33 BC, when our Lord was crucified, to 
to 70, the year 70. Uh, that's the first age of the church. And it's the age of the apostles. Because that's the age from the moment of, from our Lord's crucifixion, 33, until the destruction of Jerusalem, 70. Those are 37 years in which the apostles uh, began, began to spread, spread. They concentrated firstly. They stayed around Jerusalem together. And then they exploded and the apostles went all over the world. You may remember that St. Thomas died in, in India. And you can still visit the place of his martyrdom. Where, because, and he's an honored figure in pagan Hindu India. And he regularly has, I think, a postage stamp in India. And the other part, Bath, St. Bartholomew died in today's Armenia, or actually Turkey, the eastern part of, the western part of Turkey. Uh, St. St. Andrew died in Greece. St. Paul and St. Peter, of course, died in Rome. St. James the Great died in Spain. They spread all over, and they carried the gospel with them. And that was the first age of the church. This, the age of sowing. That's when the, the apostles sowed the gospel all over the world. Uh, and that's the second age, is that those are the, the, the age of the martyrs. The first martyr, there were, there were ten martyrs, mar, ten persecutions under the Roman Empire, uh, by the Romans at Rome. The first was under Nero, a little before 70. The last was Diocletian, a little before 313. There were ten bloody persecutions, one after another. That then is the age of the martyrs. And that's the age when the church was consolidated. The martyrs with their blood sealed, sealed the foundations of the church. Their blood acted as cement. And if you and I today are Roman Catholics, it's due, of course, firstly to Peter and Paul, but then immediately afterwards it's due to 300 years of, of 200 close on 300 years of, uh, of martyrs. Girls, boys, old men, young men, intellectuals, simple people, working people, that gave their lives, that went down the throats of lions and uh, consolidated the church and converted Rome. Um, when the persecutions began, the virile and warlike Romans were determined to smash this sect that claimed the truth the claim that all the other religions in Rome, exactly, Rome practiced ec ecumenism, but the Christians said, no way, Jose, ecumenism is wrong. Your emperor, you're wrong. You're worshiping devils, said these virgins, these young girls, to the emperor. And the emperor said, I will crush you if you dare to say that. Emperor, I can't say anything else. My Lord and Master Jesus Christ is the only God. You are worshiping devils and you will go to hell. Burn her. And the little girls stood up to it, obviously with the help of the Holy Ghost. And this example of the martyrs, all of the martyrs, but perhaps especially the young girls, because it's very impressive when a young girl goes through martyrdom. Uh, the, with this example, the Romans finally submitted. These warlike, virile Romans submitted and bowed their heads under the yoke of Christ. That was the, that was the result, the stupendous result of the, of the age of the martyrs. And so in the 313 was the Battle of the Milvian Bridge when Emperor Constantine defeated another co-emperor. There were four emperors, or two main ones at that time. Constantine defeated Maxentius. Constantine became the only emperor. And uh, before the key battle of the Milvian Bridge, which still exists, it was built by Milvius about 100 years before Christ, the bridge still exists. There's somebody who obeyed the laws of engineering. Those were <laughs> <laughs> One arch was, was blown up, I think, at the time of Garibaldi, the, the Italian Revolution around 1870. But otherwise, the bridge is still there. So anyway, that's where the battle took place. And, and before the battle, our Lord appeared to Constantine and said, in this sign you will conquer. And he showed him the, um, the banner with the Cairo, the cross, the diagonal cross, is the Greek letter chi or ch, and the p is actually the Greek letter for r. So chr is the beginning of Christus, and uh, our Lord told Max in, uh, Constantine, if you put this symbol on your battle standards, you will win the battle. Constantine had the good sense to do what our Lord told him. 
and he won. He won the battle, he became the sole emperor, and from then on, the Roman Empire, instead of being pagan, Rome became officially Christian. The government became Christian, the emperor was Christian, thanks to these martyrs. So, um, 313, the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, ended, brought to an end the age of the martyrs, and from now on, the police are no longer tracking down the Christians, the police are now protecting the Christians. And the Christians are no longer going down the throats of the lions because they're no longer being martyred. So the devil had been persecuting the church by blood, by martyrdom. The devil had to change tactics because blood, martyrdom would no longer work because the police were now on the side of the Christians. Mm -hmm. So the third age of the church goes from, goes from 313 to about 500, plus or minus 500. And it's the age of the great church doctors. Not Irenaeus. Irenaeus is down about 200. That's today's doctor. But the, um, the, uh, the, the, there's a cluster of doctors at this, in this age of the church. Why? Because the devil is, is no longer able to, able to attack the bodies, because the police are now protecting the bodies. He's attacking the minds with heresy instead. So the great heresies, the Nestorian heresy, the Arian heresy, the Monophysite heresy, these great heresies, the Pelagian heresy, they all belong to this era, the Donatist, the Donatist heresies are. But in any case, there's a cluster of, of heresies and the, the God raises very fine Catholic teachers, very fine Catholic minds, the Catholic doctors, to combat the heresies and to overcome the heresies to protect the minds. The bodies are now protected, the minds are going to be protected. You belong to this age, you've got four, the four, all four Greek doctors. There are four famous Greek doctors, four famous Latin doctors. To this age belong four of the Greeks and three of the Latins. Uh, Gregory of Nyssa, Gregory of Nazans, Basil and Athanasius. Those are the four Greek doctors. They all belong to this period. Of the, of the Latin doctors, you've got Ambrose, uh, Augustine, and Jerome all belong to this period. Only St. Gregory the Great comes later. So uh, you've also got St. Chrysostom. You've also got uh, St. Jerome, St. Augustine. St. Chrysostom also belongs to this period. Athanasius. He, Athanasius, yes. He's one of the, Greek, one of the four Greeks. Uh, Chrys Chrysostom is also a Greek. So you've got a cluster of doctors, and they hammer out the doctrine of the church. They don't change the doctrine, but they make it they develop it so that whereas the, for instance, the, the, the Apostles' Creed, which we recite with the Rosary, I believe, uh, I believe in God the Father, and the Creator, and, the Lord, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, not very developed. The, a part, the creed at, 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 at Sunday is the Athanasian Creed, a God of God, light of light, true God of true God, consubstantial with the Father, and so on and so on. Uh, it, it's rather more developed. It's exactly the same divine law of Jesus Christ, whereas the Apostles' Creed is, says it quite relatively simply. The Athanasian Creed, as it's called, develops precisely because it's occurring in this third period and the, de the, 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 definite, the description of our Lord is developed to, to kill off the heresies. God of God, light of light, true God of true God, to emphasize that Jesus Christ is God. Consubstantial with the Father, not just similar, but of the very same substance as the Father, one God, one substance. These things are substance, person, nature. These, these technical terms are developed in this period, and the doctrine of the Church is very much hammered out, as, as we've had it ever since. This doctrine, uh, hammered out in this period, it stays always exactly the same. It will need, the next time, the, the, when it will really need a good deal more development, is uh, against Protestantism. It's the heresies that oblige the church to hammer out her doctrine. Modernism obliged Pius X to go into questions which then were just common sense, you know, th straight thinking, normal thinking. But the modern world is rotting normal thinking. And so the church has to say, this is normal thinking and this is, this is Catholic thinking. It's not a supernatural, supernatural truth, it's just natural truth that the church has to defend. So um, the church is all the time needing to defend the truth against the next attack. 
uh, think of a stockade with cowboys and engines, and um, if the engines are attacking from the west, it's no use defending the stockade on the east. You've got to defend the, the church's stockade, the church, the church's doctrine. You've got to defend where it's being attacked. When the devil is defeated on the west wall, the west part of the stockade, he'll turn to the north, he'll turn to the south, he'll turn to the east, and the church has to wheel around and defend whatever part is being attacked. Today, the very <coughs> basics of nature are being attacked. For instance, I always mention this classic example, the difference between man and woman, the deep, natural difference between man and woman, which the modern world pretends doesn't exist. You've got nappy, nappy counters in all of the men's lavatories. I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, obviously, it, the woman has a capacity to mother and look after little children, which a man doesn't have, and he shouldn't have. But there you are. Oh no, no, there's no difference. The wa the woman might just as well go out to work and slug it out in the in 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 the workplace. And the man might just as well stay at home and look after the babies. I mean, ridiculous, ridiculous, ridiculous. But it's, it's common sense that there's a big difference between man and woman. There's a marvelous complementarity, which is what makes marriages work when they do work. They work less and less because boys and girls know less and less their part, the parts they have to play. The boys are all twisted up in knots because they don't know how to be boys. They don't know what as boys they're meant to be doing. And the girls are just strutting all over and trampling all over because, again, they don't know their place. The boys don't know their place and the girls don't know their place. And, and old-fashioned common sense on the question is just dismissed completely as old-fashioned nonsense. It's not. It's old-fashioned sense. But that's how the, today the very basics of nature, not just the supernatural truths, but the very basics of nature are, are being attacked, coming under attack and are being broken up. And that's where the church needs to defend today. Is it doing that? Some, some, you do get some natural sense coming out of Rome still, but not, not nearly enough. We come into the fourth age, which is the age of a thousand years and it's the age of Christendom. And it goes on until 1517, which is when Luther's Protestantism broke out. It's the age of Christendom. It's the thousand years when Christ was in control of civilization, when the world was Christian, when the nations were converting. England converted, France converted under Clovis just before 500. England converted about 100 years later. And then there was Russia, there was Moravia, there was Bohemia, uh, the Hungary. These nations converted one after another, and it's the glorious age of Christendom. And we look back to these Middle Ages. These are the Middle Ages. Those are the early ages, and these are modern times. Modern times, ancient, ancient times, and the Middle Ages. The Middle Ages are the glory of Christendom. They're the great cathedrals, the great buildings, and the foundations of Western, what's called today, Western civilization. People today can't, can't bear to call it Christendom. They can't bear to recognize Jesus Christ in any way. Jesus Christ has got to be absolutely ruled out. So we talk about Western civilization. And Western civilization is Christianity without Christ. And it doesn't work. And it's not working. Western civilization, quote unquote, is collapsing. Because it's trying to recreate Christian, Christendom without Christ. Christendom without Christ is endom. Not take Christ out of Christendom, and what you all you've got is endom, which you would just add an O and you've got an add a, a D and an O, and endom is end doom. And Christ, Christianity without Christ is end doom. And this is the end, the Antichrist. So from the middle of the Middle Ages, the decline begins. Um, the decline begins. Very soon after the greatest church theologian, which is the greatest church doctor, St. Thomas Aquinas occurs about the 1200s. Exactly. He occurs in the 1200s. Um, after, but very soon after him comes Duns Scotus, another famous church theologian of the Franciscans. But Duns Scotus is contradicting Thomas almost wherever he can. He takes the opposite positions from Thomas on many theological questions. The spirit of contrariety, 
a spirit of the Franciscan, jealous of the Dominican, trying to rival the Dominican. In any case, St. Thomas Aquinas' great true solutions almost immediately begin to be undermined. That's poor old human nature. Of course, the Dominicans and the Church, the Church backs Thomas Aquinas fully. At the Council of Trent, the, the theology of St. Thomas Aquinas will be on the altar where the, the, the fathers are deliberating how to match and how to stop and block Protestantism. So the Church, the church grabbed hold of Thomas Aquinas big time. But there were thinkers, church thinkers, who were already were discontented and beginning to undermine it. And, and so we come into the decline, the decline of Christianity belief begins. If we put the, where will we put the center, the high point of Christendom? Let's say the high point is plus or minus 1,200. Then it's going to be a, a, a decline of 800 years. Let's give a give or take, 700, 800 years, from 12, 1,200 down to 2,000. We'll see, we'll come to that. So, uh, the, the, from now it's a decline. For instance, St. Vincent Ferrer is a great Dominican preacher, and in, in 1,400, he is so struck by the decadence of Christendom, by the decadence of the church, by the decadence of men, he's so struck he thinks the end of the world is, 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 is going to occur around 1400. Actually, of course, it's, it's, uh, he's, he was out by about 600 years, or 650 years. You know, little mistake of timing, a little mistake of the calendar. But actually, he had foreseen, he foresaw that this meant that, that this implied that, and that this was going to happen. Only if it, he saw it happening much faster than it happened. Uh, another to saint that, ha that, 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 a saint that, that God gave to block the fall, to slow down the fall, was Joan of Arc. Joan of Arc did not exist primarily to get beat, to beat the, the English out of France, although she did do that. She started that process. Uh, uh, but she was, she, her, her driving purpose was to get the French king, the legitimate French king, even if he was a creep or a jerk, but the legitimate French king crowned officially, properly in Reims and anointed in order to want, restore the backing of God behind the monarchies, behind the church, or behind the authorities of the state, to get the church behind the state and to re-establish re authority. And that's what happened. It lasted, the French monarchy lasted from 1430 or 31, when, 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 when the, the French king was, was consecrated, anointed properly with the holy oil, which went all the way back to Clovis, or what? The, the holy oil of, um, of the anointing of the French kings. And it had to be in the Cathedral of Reims, R-E-I-M-S. And Joan of Arc insisted upon that. That was her driving purpose. She succeeded. The king of France, was not a great king, but he was anointed, and that meant that the authority was behind the French monarchy. It lasted until the French Revolution in 1789, when the French had his the French king's head was cut off in 1792, unless I'm mistaken. Uh, so <clears throat> there's another example of God giving saints to slow the process down. But the process brought came to, to Protestantism. Protestantism was a gigantic heresy. It was a gigantic disaster for the church. Protestantism was the beginning of the modern world. You may say that Protestantism was prepared. It broke out in 1517 with Luther nailing his thesis to the, the door of the church of Wittenberg. You may well say that the, the Reformation didn't happen overnight. Much better, of course, called the Deformation, but it's usually called the Reformation. The Reformation did not happen overnight. It's perfectly true. But uh, when it happened, it was a decisive event to launch the modern world and to really set the church going downhill because the Protestant Reformation introduced the fifth age of the church which is the age of apostasy apostasy means falling away falling away from God the collapse of the faith uh, and the, 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 the apostasy la the, the fifth age lasted has lasted for the last 500 years, nearly 500 years now, 
We're in 2013, 1517 to 2013 is just four years shy of 500 years. Christendom lasted a thousand years, Asia of the Apostasy is lasting 500 years. It, it, it has taken a long time to undo the Christian fabric of society, but it is coming undone. This, this uh, age of apostasy uh, took, has consisted in a rolling attack, one great wave after another. The first wave was Luther and Protestantism, who denied the church, but still believed, quote-unquote, in Jesus Christ and in God. The second wave, that was 1517, the second wave, great wave, was liberalism and masonry which masonry was launched in its modern form in London in 1717. So you've got 1517, 1717, and 1917, which was communism. So Luther denied the church but accepted Christ and God. The Masons denied the church and denied Christ but still accepted God, or said they do. And then the communists refuse the church, refuse Christ, and refuse God. So it's, it's a building attack on the church, a building apostasy. And the fifth, the fifth le the, the letter to the fifth church is very interesting. And it's a letter of the Holy Ghost to our own times. Because we are living at the end of the fifth age of the church. Uh, Bartholomew Holzhauser, the venerable Bartholomew Holzhauser, Really thought he was living towards the, in, in the fifth age, but we are now, and that was in the early 1600s, we're now living at the end of the fifth age. Everything now is coming apart. And this, that everything now is coming apart is the logical conclusion of the rise and fall of Christendom and the progressive undoing of Christendom by the age of apostasy. The instruction of the Holy Ghost to the church, I think it is of Sardis, the fifth age, is the beginning of chapter 3 of the book of the Apocalypse, and it says, has anyone got a, a New Testament uh, with them, by any chance? No? Okay. Um, because the, that letter is very, it says, preserve what's still left. It says, it begins something like this, um, you, have the out, the, you have the exterior of piety, but I see that you don't have the interior of piety. Your religion is a sham. You're, hypo you're hypocrites. Um, then it says, not everybody is uh, a hypocrite. There are some of you that have not gone along with this time, with this corruption of the age, and you will make it to heaven. But the understanding is the large number of people are pretending to be Christians and they aren't. And that's exactly it. This is an age of apostasy and of hypocrisy because Coming down from Christendom, everybody knows the prestige and glory of Christendom, but they want to dance with the devil, so they pay honor, outwardly honor to Christ, but inwardly they're wanting to go with the devil. And so you've got this, this hypocrisy of the heart belonging to the devil while the exterior belongs to God. And that's typical of Protestantism, of liberalism, and communism. All three are a false Catholicism. Protestantism pretends to be a reformation of the Catholicism. It isn't. It's a defamation. Liberalism is also a pretense of Christianity. A liberal is a sweet guy. He's a nice guy. Everything is sweet and everything is nice. But you oppose his liberalism and he suddenly turns very nasty. Uh, then uh, communism is another that presented the ideas of communism to Winston Churchill. And he snorted and he said, ha! Christianity with a tomahawk, meaning co communism pretends to, to be loving of neighbor, looking after the people. But in fact, if the people don't become communists, then the communists are going to use tomahawks to make sure that the people become communists. They use necklaces and the rest of it, you know, burning, filling a tire with gasoline and light bulbs. They, they use, they're now using these techniques in Syria to force Syria into the global world, the global system. Terrible. Our newspapers are lying and lying and lying about Syria. The real terrorists are financed, the terrorists that are dis trying to undermine Syria are financed by the UK, by the, uh, by the US, and so on. Your country and mine. That's it. We are, 
we're the bad guys. It's not the Syrian, it's not Assad who's the bad guy. It's the Brits and the Yanks. I hate to say it, but I'm afraid that's the truth. Uh, but the news, our vile newspapers and our vile television pretend that these terrorists are heroes and that Assad is a dictator and a villain. Nothing of the kind. Nothing of the kind. As anybody who's been to Syria can tell. But how our newspapers lie. Unbearable. Satan is the prince of lies. And then people, people will say to you, Oh, you mustn't talk about politics. You must talk about things nice like the sacred heart. Well, I'm, I'm all for talking about sacred heart. <laughs> but, you know, if, people, if people's minds are brainwashed with nonsense about Syria, sooner or later, either the good sense about the sacred heart washes out the nonsense on Syria, and my, the true religion makes me realize what liars our media are, or what often happens, the lies about politics undermine the truth about religion. A, ca a man can't have two, two systems in his mind without them fighting one another. And a lot of modern people have the modern media in their brains, and the modern media present an absolutely anti-Christian view of life, which will undermine the faith unless C Catholics watch out. And unless they think and use their minds to think what's really going on. <clears throat> the age of apostasy comes to an end. We don't exactly know when. But it's, it's such a mess. It, it, <clears throat> such a mess is being piled up. Uh, uh, Holzhauser, the venerable Holzhauser, thought it would come to an end with the chastisement, with the great punishment, with the great intervention of God. Because a, only a great intervention of not God could clean up such a mess as we've got today. And if you and I look at with eyes that have with, with eyes with clear eyes at the mess we have today, just like it's like in the time of Noah. Pius X died in 1958, and before he, Pius XII died in 1958, and before he died, he said the world was worse than in the time of Noah than in the time of Sodom and Gomorrah. What would he say today? <laughs> 50 years down the pipe from 1958, for goodness sakes, the world has got unbelievably worse, outwardly at any rate. Inwardly, it was already gone in 1958, but outwardly, it's got that much worse. The evil just goes on from day to day, latest the Supreme Court approving of legalizing uh, same-sex marriages. And you may know now, unless I'm mistaken, Catholic hospitals are going to be obliged Mm -hmm. to give out artificial means of birth control. And are the Catholic hospitals still going to be able to operate under those conditions? No. And the, the, the modern governments are going to come after us if we don't believe in globalism, if we don't believe in what they're up to, if we believe that they're delinquents, which they are, they're apostates and enemies of God and enemies of our Lord Jesus Christ, they're not going to tolerate that. Liberals... If you attack their liberalism, if you say their liberalism is fundamentally rotten, they don't tolerate that. Out come the claws of hawks, and they've got their FEMA camps already ready, apparently all over the United States, and I'm quite sure in England. In England, you've now got one camera in the streets for every 15 Englishmen. <laughs> England is being turned into an absolute police state. It's, happening. it's happening here as well, yes. It's happening. Yeah, sure. You, you hear the police when you stand there and stop. Yeah. 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 So, um, you know, the, this uh, and this is this is the end of the fifth age. The fifth, when will the fifth age come to an end? I wouldn't be at all surprised if the chast there was a, a, a huge chastisement within five years. I could easily be wrong. F Saint Vincent Ferret made a 600-year mistake of the calendar because he had X-ray eyes that saw what in, he saw inside. He saw inside this situation and saw that it meant that. Today, uh, you and I are sitting about here maybe, and we think this is very close. It may not be all that close. The, the wheels of God grind slowly, says the proverb, but grind exceeding small. God doesn't miss a thing because he's God. But he has got a great deal of patience. And therefore, this terrible situation may go on longer than we think. But I wouldn't be surprised if the chastisement occurred within the next five years. I, that's all I would say. It could easily be more than five years. I don't know for sure, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was not far away. 
Anyway, then the, the, the end of the, the fifth age ends, according to Holzhauser, with the great intervention of God. And then begins the sixth age. The fifth age, the chastisement will have cleaned up, will have cleaned up the horrors that we, of corruption that we have all around us today. God will intervene. A lot of people will die. Um, Our Lady of Ak is, is spoke in Japan about this chastisement in 1973 at Akita, A-K-I-T-A. -A. If you don't know the third message of Akita, look it up on the internet. She says, if men don't change their ways, but nobody, everybody else is angelic. <laughs> stupid, simply stupid. But it's Hollywood. Remember the sound of music? Everybody's nice, the hills are alive, just the Nazis are nice. You know? <laughs> silly, silly, silly stuff. Silly stuff. Six, there will be a great triumph. Many prophecies down the centuries and down the ages have spoken of this great triumph of Our Lady, uh, which will be the greatest triumph ever of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church's last glorious appearance. Um, the, only, the, 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 the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. That's what makes sense. In all of the previous ages, we're talking about the past, which we know for certain. Now we're into the future, which is not so certain. But it does look as though the Sixth Age will not last long. Uh, Our Lady at La Salette uh, appeared to two little French children in 1846, and she gave a long secret to the children of La Salette. It's known as the Secret of La Salette. And um, La Salette. And there she said that she spoke at length of the Fifth Age, which is our own age. Uh, and then she spoke, she, she speaks briefly of the Sixth Age, and the sixth age, she said, will not last long because 25 years of harvest will make men forget. In other words, 25 years of good harvests are going to make the survivors prosperous once more, prosperous, fat, and happy. And as Moses warns in the book of Deuteronomy, when you're prosperous and fat and happy, be careful because you're going to forget God. Of course, that's what's happened in the modern Western nations. They've had an unrivaled prosperity, and they've forgotten God. So um, the, the great prosperity the, 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 is going to begin in the horror of having survived this tremendous punishment of God. All of this makes sense to me, makes good sense to me. They're going to be shaking with fright, and then, then conditions, since they have the fear of God and the love of God, that all, all the world will be Catholic, practically all the world will be Catholic, England, Russia, and China will convert, that says one prophecy. And uh, the, the mankind will get back on his feet, the survivors will get back on their feet, and it will be a very happy age because everybody will be uh, believing and genuinely Catholic because they've got the fear of God is back in them, as it should be. It should be in all of us, the real fear of God. And, but then... Uh, 25 years and the corruption comes back. The corruption begins to come back, like today. And the corruption will introduce the seventh age, which will be the reign of the Antichrist. Or the age of the Antichrist. He is going to fight, he's going to be young, glamorous, brilliant, attractive, a charming, a good, a good politician, great politician, great warrior. He's going to, scripture says he's going to make war on three kingdoms. He will conquer three kingdoms and then the other, the rest of the ten kingdoms of the world will submit. He will be ruler of the world. His reign will, when he's full, fully ruler, his reign will last three and a half years. There will be the most terrible persecution ever of the Catholic Church. God will send, says scripture, two heroes to stand up for his cause, Enoch and Elias. Uh, one, a, one a Gentile, the other a Jew, Elias a Jew, Enoch a Gentile, and they will be killed by the Antichrist, and then God will finally intervene, he will blow away the Antichrist with the breath of his mouth, says scripture, or the Antichrist will, will sort of be raised up in a kind of ascension, and then the devil will, uh, God will cut out his diabolical powers, he'll crash to the earth, that'll be the end of the Antichrist, and then perhaps 
if one interprets a verse of Daniel correctly, 45 days are perhaps, 45 days after the death of the Antichrist will come the end of the world and the general judgment. So that is the seventh, the seventh age. Notice that it will take the, the 1,000 years corrupted over 500, the 25, the 25 years, or let's say 30 years maybe, corrupted in 15, the, 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 it's much faster, but as, as four is to five, so six is to seven in a certain way. Of, in a certain, what we're going through now is a foreshadowing of the, of the reign of the Antichrist. Now, I, we're talking about things not certain because they're future, we don't know for sure. But um, Bartholomew Holzhauser, uh, the sixth age, the, there are, of, the seven, of the seven letters to the seven churches, only two do not contain any rebuke or criticism. That's the second age, because when the Christians are being persecuted, they don't need to be criticized. When they're being persecuted and hammered and trampled down on, then they need rather to be encouraged. So the second age contains no criticism. The sixth age also contains no criticism, because the world is, is virtuous during the sixth age. It's only to the end of the sixth age that the corruption comes back. So the second age like corresponds to the sixth. There's a certain symmetry, a certain pattern, a certain beauty in this picture, this vision, this understanding of the history of the church. It, it makes sense, so to speak. And it makes, it's, it's reassuring in a way today because we can see that God has a purpose in allowing this tremendous corruption. God has his purpose. It's going to uh, culminate in a great triumph of the church. The triumph may corrupt again, but in, in the end, uh, as Amer one American was one, once invited to sum up the book of the Apocalypse, and he summed it up in three words. Jesus gonna win. And that's about the, that's the message. Jesus gonna win. And that's the message of the Apocalypse. So that, you know, that was American. maybe he wasn't Catholic, but he, had his, he knew his scripture and he got the essence of it. Jesus going to win, and Jesus going to win. So, um, interesting to note that um, Vatican II is, is the, the end of the fifth age, or towards the end of the fifth age. Vatican II is the conclusion, the logical conclusion, of Protestantism, liberalism, and modernism. We may have time to have a look at that. It's, it's interesting. Um, uh, the fifth age is the end of the Tridentine Church, or the, with the fifth age, the, the, the Tridentine Church is the Church of the Council of Trent. The Church, as the Council of Reformation, opposed to Protestantism, pulled the Church together and fortified and strengthened it against Protestantism. But that, that Church is now, with Vatican II, that Church pulled together began to fall apart again. The system of defense, brought by the Council of Trent, is, is today broken. Also broken, interestingly, is what's called the Constantinian Church. Uh, with the Emperor Constantine, there was the union of church and state, which today, our ideal is the separation of church and state. Well, that's the liberal's ideal, it's not the Catholic ideal. The Catholic ideal is that the state should, is a creature of God like the church, and the state should be Catholic. The state should work with the Catholic church, not with the Protestant church, not with the Hindu church, whatever it is, not with any other church, but the state and the Catholic church should be united so that the state will do everything in its power to help souls to get to heaven. Imagine if the state passed only Catholic laws, in other words, absolutely condemned pornography, absolutely condemned abortion, absolutely condemned uh, the, you know, these various immor immoral immoralities, how it would help the salvation of souls. But God allows the states to go corrupt, as they have done, he allows them to become liberal, and then the, li the, the pornography is <coughs> has a free run. We adults should be ashamed of a society which exposes the children and the boys and the girls 
to pornography. We should be ashamed. But we've, it's, it's normal. We're now, you, we, we get used to one horror after another, completely lose sense of what horrors we're living with, and the world just gets worse and worse. And who, can, who and what can stop it? Apparently nothing. But the scripture says, the, the letter to the fifth church says, um, uh, those that there are, not all of you are going along with the corruption. It says, save what was about to perish. That's exactly what the traditionalists are trying to do. Save what was about to perish. The church is collapsing. Archbishop of the saves what he can. The society is now very close to collapsing, if not actually collapsing, and the resistance, the quote-unquote resistance, is doing what it can to save what can still be saved of the society about to perish. So you, you, you and I, according to our feeble means, are doing what we can to do what the Holy Ghost told the fifth church to do, to save what is about to perish. It's very interesting to watch. And then it, and it says, I think I quoted it, the letter to the fifth church says, um, not everybody, there, uh, there is a minority that, uh, and you will get to heaven. If you're, if you're faithful amidst this falling corrupt world, you will get to heaven. Um, the Constantinian church, so, so thanks to the martyrs, the Roman Empire became Catholic, and then all of these nations were Catholic. They were Catholic until our own age, Luther, with Luther, the, the Germany was shaken free, so to speak, of the Catholic Church. England cut with the Catholic Church. Terrible thing. And England's been cut ever since. Terrible. Terrible, terrible. Before, uh, the England was called Merry England. It is not Merry now. It's grey, grey, grey. Grey, liberal, miserable England. It's terrible. Terrible. And very corrupt. Oof. There's very little faith in England now, thanks to the wretched Reformation. God in his mercy gave England a, new, a renewal of Catholicism <coughs> in the 1830s, 1840s. It was called the Second Spring. But England has got rid of that as well, so now Vatican II. But there are a few souls in England, and they are fervent, they're good. But the few souls, the, traditional, the traditionalists in England are not many, but they are they are fairly solid. They don't like what's going on in the society, generally speaking. Pray for the English traditionalists that they hang in there. Uh, so, but then the Vatican II was the end. It was the end, not only the end of the Tridentine Church, it was also the end of the Constantinian Church because from the ideal of Vatican II is again separation of church and state. And so that's the end of the union of church and state. The union of church and state was a glorious gift, but it men threw it away after a certain time. So what we're going through now is really the pits. It's a, a, an enormous turning away from God. But this turning away from God and the, it has its purpose. It looks as though it will end in a great chastisement. Then there will be a great triumph, and soon after that, the, end, the Antichrist and the end of the world. Now, we are... It's nearly nine o'clock, I think this time. Let me give you another picture of what's happening to the society. Against that background, a picture of what's happening to the society. Firstly, any questions on the seven ages of the church? Anybody got a question? If not, I will happily continue. Yes. Bishop, I would like to know, in, in Our Lady of La Salette, I read that she said the church would be eclipsed. Yes. Is that what Vatican II did? Is exactly. It the church? The church is eclipsed. In other words, it's still there, but it's hidden. Yeah. You can't see it. You can just see some of its light coming off. But it's blocked. The church is blocked. It's, it's, it hasn't disappeared. It hasn't vanished. But it is, its light is, is wiped out. We can't see it, and we can't see it shining. That's, that's the situation of the church today. The Catholic Church is still there, but it's, it's not able to shine. Yes? Well, Our Lady at La Salette, didn't she also say that Rome would lose the faith and become the seat of the Antichrist? You see, well, that's... Yeah, yes. 
And the Roma is today definitely losing the faith. Archbishop Lefebvre have said that. They, 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 don't, they just don't have the faith. But I don't think it's yet the seat of the Antichrist. So it'll be in the seventh age, it will be the seat of the Antichrist. That's my opinion. Some people think that we're already at the end of the world. I don't think so. I don't think so. I think there's still some resistance. There's too much resistance in the world for the Antichrist to come yet. But give it the chastisement, the great triumph, and then the corruption of the great triumph. That's what's going to be terrible. But it's going to be parallel to what we've got today. What we've got today is like a dress rehearsal for the Antichrist. But I don't think it's the Antichrist himself. Yes. The, uh, the, new, the new Pope, he, he doesn't want to be called Pope. He wants to be called the Bishop of Rome. Does that make any sense? It's the undoing of the papacy. By a, he's got the democratic mentality. He thinks like the newspapers. Several people who are Kelly's ask me, what do you think of the new pope? And I say, uh, I sort of begin to pull a face. Oh, I thought he was very good. Uh. The pope is on the modern wavelength. He appeals to the newspapers. He appeals to the world. But I, I try to say to people, does he appeal to God? I'm not so sure. He's, it's, the, it's the undoing of the papacy. It's the success of the enemies of the church. Because they know that if only they can undo the papacy, they can undo the church. But God has it all under control. And, and even Pope Francis might, might, suddenly have his Damascus. It's not impossible. Human beings are very strange. In the north of England they say, there's not so queer as folk. <laughs> the Greek tragedian Sophocles said the same thing. There are many strange things, but there's nothing stranger than, than man. <laughs> the, 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 Greek, the Greek was a little more elegant than the North English proverb, but both say exactly the same thing. People are queer. I mean, people are strange. People are unpredictable. Pope Francis looks like a complete write-off. But don't be su I wouldn't be surprised. I would not be surprised. If, since he's such a jerk, Ex excuse me, you say that, but you know what I mean. Since he's such a jerk, he, maybe he'll turn completely around. It might be. Some people say to me, you must be mad not to think of such a thing. Well, we'll see. Time will tell. But I wouldn't be surprised. If it, the, the great and good God has a lot of tricks up his sleeve, and the conversion of Pope Francis might be one of them. I wouldn't exclude it. Yes? I just want to mention it um, uh, do they talk in Europe about um, the fact that the three there are three countries in Syria, Egypt, and Iraq, when the other leaders were there, the church was left alone. Yeah, that's right. But now the uh, our, our, yes. our nation that's our right. nation is paying five and a half billion dollars to Muslim Brotherhood to go yes. in. They must know that they're killing Oh yes, oh yes. The people. devil is always after after Christians to kill them, get rid of them. And it's so, like, it's I, don't the, understand, I don't understand why people don't see the fact that Islam is... People are dumb. <laughs> people are dumb. I mean, in the 16th chapter of John... The, new, the, newspaper, the newspapers glorify Islam and glorify the Jews, glorify the Hindus. The only people that are mocked and are not allowed to stand up for themselves are the Christians. Yeah, that's, uh, that's in our schools now. Yeah, schools. Like, in, in the uh, yeah, it's, 16th it's, chapter of John, our Lord pre predicts what they're going to do. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, all right. Well, now, uh, what? Let's go. Let's go back to the Middle Ages, and here we've got the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages. <coughs> yeah. And then comes Protestantism. And Protestantism takes about a third of Christendom, of the, of the Christendom of the Middle Ages, and swings it off to the left. That's Protestantism. Protestantism. That's in the 1500s. The Catholic Church, the Counter-Reformation, rebuilds and expands. So the Counter-Reformation... is the opposition of the church to the Protestants, and it rebuilds. For instance, 
the whole of Latin America, Central and Southern America, is conquered for the, for the faith by the, the, the Spanish and Portuguese missionaries. Mm -hmm. Today, that's called wicked colonialism. The, the media say that's colonialism, and so on and so on. But actually, as Catholics, we know that if those, so it was a rosary of nations, of Catholic nations, a rosary of nations that was created by the, the effect of the Counter-Reformation and the effect of the French, of the, especially of the Spanish uh, um, monarchs, the Catholic monarchs, is Ferdinand and Isabella, that Columbus, a tremendous work of evangelization, a tremendous expansion of the Catholic Church. So the Catholic Church continues straight and the Counter-Reformation rebuilds. As I was saying, exactly at the moment that in, uh, England quits the faith, Our Lady, appearing at Guadalupe, creates a Catholic nation of Mexico, which has been very Catholic ever since. And the Masons have specially persecuted Mexico. It's still there. Mexico is strong in tradition, and now it's now strong in the resistance. It's interesting. It's, it's down the ages. The ages the, there's a pattern that keeps repeating itself down the ages. Father Hugo knows a good deal about the Cristeros, who were the heroes of the um, Catholic resistance to the and the Masons in the 20th century. A tremendous story, and they were betrayed by the by by the Church. Counter-Reformation, then the devil comes back and attacks again. So this time, it's liberalism that swings off to the left. Liberalism. And Vatican II sweeps the, almost the whole thing off to, to in line with modernism. It's the retread of modernism, which is the retread of liberalism and Protestantism. It's all basically the same thing. Uh, the church, uh, Archbishop Lefebvre, continues the straight line of Catholicism. Archbishop III. He sticks to the true faith and continues the straight line of Catholicism. Straight. He holds straight and he begin, He also begins to rebuild. He, the, the, his society begins to expand throughout the world. A few years ago, uh, well, a year ago, the last few years, the society has been all over the world. There are a few countries, well, there are many countries the society has been or visited, priests visit. Now, the society expands, and we've got the SSPX, therefore. Now, on this pattern, what's going to happen next? On this pattern, the devil is going to come back, and he's going to take a great chunk of the SSPX with him. No. In line with Vatican II, in line with modernism, in line with liberalism, and in line with Protestantism. In other words, what's now happening, the corruption of the society today, which is a retread of Vatican II, happening inside the society, is entirely in line with this total pattern. It's yet another swing to the left. It's absolutely normal and natural for our corrupt world, for the corrupt one world, to produce yet another swing to the left. So it's, it falls, into, it falls into, into place, so to speak. It's very sad, it's wrong, it's not right, and it's not wise, but it's happening. And so what again is the, this time there's almost nothing left, so to speak, almost nothing left, to keep, it's the, it's the, it's the dear little resistance. So it's, that was a remnant, this is the remnant of a remnant. And in a few years' time, the same thing will happen again if the resistance pulls itself together. Uh, give it a few years, and then the resistance will fall again. Well, there'll be a chunk of the resistance that swings off to the left, if God doesn't intervene between now and then. So, it's very sad. Again, you notice that this is the fifth age of the church, from Protestantism through liberalism to modernism and the end of the fifth age. At the end of the fifth age, before the chastisement, it's natural that the society would also get corrupted. I, it, I hate to say it. It's not, you know, it's not natural in one, not, it's not nor, it's not natural in one sense, because apostasy is not natural.
but it's normal in another sense because it's the way the modern age is. So if we are realistic and see things as they are, we see that what's happening out of the society is, is all too normal for our wicked age. So, uh, soldier on, my dear friends, and uh, keep, your, keep your wedding garment clean, as I think the letter to the fifth age says. Father, you don't have a, a New Testament with you, do you? No. <laughs> Could you bring it up on your blackboard? Uh, Apocalypse uh, chapter uh, chapter three, or Book of Revelation chapter three, the beginning of chapter three, because it's very interesting. As is the Holy Ghost speaking to our time? according to Bartholomew Holzhauser, makes a lot of sense. It fits what's going on now. The, the essential thing to, to hold on to is that God never abandons, will never abandon a soul that does not first abandon him. That's, that's Augustine speaking. So the world can go to rack and ruin, but if I do not want to abandon God, He's not going to abandon me. He's going to, I'll have to abandon him before he will abandon me. So, you know, they'll put us in a FEMA camp. They will take away the priests. They will torture us. They'll put on a black hood, electric sparks, whatever it is. I don't know. But it doesn't matter. As long as I'm in a state of grace, it's not going to be very pleasant, of course, but the end, you know, it doesn't. If I live and die in the state of grace, what does it matter? I just go, I, I will go to heaven. So, and nothing... St. Paul says, you know, can, what can separate me from the love of Christ? It's Romans chapter 8. Neither persecution, nor sword, nor famine, nor... Uh, and he goes through a long list of all the various miseries and misfortunes. None of them can separate me from the love of Christ. There's only one thing that can separate me from the love of Christ, and that's sin. There's only one thing that can throw me into hell. It was the gospel of today's Master St. Irenaeus. Don't be afraid of those that can persecute the body. Be afraid of those that can get hold of the soul. And that's the devil, temptations, and sin. Anyone that tends to sin. Is it coming up, Father? Yes. Quick question, Your Excellency. Um, while we're waiting on Father, but yes. you, you kind of laid out you know, the doctrinal errors of Protestantism, liberalism, modernism. Yes. Could you expound a little bit on doctrinal errors, or at least the main ones, or the lack of teaching true doctrine at the SSPF. It's now going in for yeah. Doctrinal Declaration of mid-April, 2012. Kept hidden for a year because Bishop Foley knew that it would raise protest if it got known. But then Father Beck says recently, apparently, he's quoted as saying, um, the the, the only problem in the society is internal, a quarrel between priests. It's absolutely not the laity's business, and that's why all of this has been kept secret. The faith is not the laity's business. I mean, come on. <laughs> but they're pretending that this is not a problem of faith. They're pretending that there's no real problem. There's a serious problem, because it's a problem of the faith. Okay, what's the problem? The acceptance of canon law is in... Is in, um, is in the Doctrine and Declaration. The acceptance of the new mass, the acceptance of the Council. The Council, Vatican II has to, things to teach us, just as tradition has things to teach Vatican II, Vatican II has things to teach tradition. That's insanity. That's putting the Vatican II and the tradition on an equal footing. That's, the, that's Benedict XVI, the hermeneutic of continuity. And another paragraph speaks of the hermeneutical, the acceptance of the council then. It, it, the acceptance of the council, of the new mass, of the code of canon law. What more do you need? Oh, what, what more do you not need? Is it coming up, Father? It isn't. It isn't. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you can't zoom in on the story the story That's a shame. So, so you, can't, you can't change the size. It's be... Oh, it's very small. Okay. Okay, well, let me try and read it. Uh, keep it, keep it lit, Father. Um, <laughs> let me try and read. It's a gem. It's very interesting. Okay, yes, I can read. 
Uh, hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Um, and to the angel of the church of Sardis, right, that's the fifth church. These things says he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast the name or appearance of being alive, and thou art dead. The church is not good in this old fifth age. Be watchful and strengthen the things that remain. Strengthen the things that remain. That's exactly what Archbishop of Fed did, and it's what the resistance is now trying to do. To strengthen what remains. I lost it. Oh, you want to bring it back? Oh, yes, please. I'll be a Okay. This one, this is the you move it that only with that. Okay, okay, okay. I mean, you literally just push it. Okay. Uh, have in mind, therefore, uh, the, the, uh, things which are ready to die. For I find not thy works full before my God. You're hypocrites. You pretend to be doing the works, but the works are not what they seem to be. And that's exactly Vatican II. That's exactly the church before Vatican II. And Vatican II was the punishment of Catholics whose works were not full before God. Have in mind, therefore, in what manner thou hast received, Remember everything the church has given you, the great gifts that come to us by the church. And observe and do penance. If then thou shalt not watch, if you don't keep awake, stay awake, I will come to thee as a thief. That was exactly Vatican II. God punishing the church because it was asleep, it wasn't watching. And thou shalt not know at what hour I will come to thee. But thou, ha but thou hast a few names in Sardis, which have not defiled, which have not defiled their garments, and uh, I'm not doing this very well. I'm sorry, I'm not very good. Um, And they shall walk with me in white because they are worthy. He that shall overcome shall thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, and I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In other words, the church in general, think about it, in general, is, today is hypocritical. The appearances don't cause, the reality is not up to the appearances. But there are a few souls in whom the reality is there, and they will have their reward and will get to heaven. So, have courage, my dear friends, because even if the resistance is reduced to just a very, very, very few souls, still, those souls that want to go to heaven, that want not to abandon God, will not be abandoned by God. And that's the, that's the bottom line. So have plenty of courage, and hang in there. Watch and pray, says our Lord. Any questions? Any questions on this? Yes. Uh, 1988 was quite a few years ago. Yes. Uh, what are the prospects of new bishops? In places? I, there, there certainly will be. Um, the, the society now has so put itself under Rome already. I mean, even without an agreement, the society has given away on the essential. And therefore, as somebody said to me last night, an agreement is no longer even necessary in a certain way, and I'm afraid that's true. The doctrinal declaration essentially sold the store. Okay, the Romans didn't buy it at that moment, but the seller was selling it. And the seller has not said, oh, I'm sorry, I realize I made a mistake. He's withdrawn the document, Bishop Foley has withdrawn, but he has not retracted. He's not submitted that he committed a single mistake. In fact, he suggests all the time he's not making a mistake. It's, it's dumb people that stopped him doing what he wanted to do because they didn't understand how brilliant he was and how brilliant his idea was. <laughs> I'm afraid that's the truth. And therefore, uh, essentially, this, the spirit of the sellout is there. And the, it's simply a matter of... You know, the agreement was only ever the ninth of the iceberg that showed. The eight ninths was the liberalism underneath. And the liberalism is still there. The, 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 the iceberg hasn't been completed, so to speak, but the eight ninths are still there. So it's simply a matter of time before there's another um, meeting. Rome can easily offer to 
to Bishop Foley a deal which he can't refuse. The reason why Rome refused in April or, or in June was surely because of the letter of the three bishops to Bishop Foley. Because in that letter, that letter made it clear that Bishop Foley would not be able to bring the great part of the society with him into Rome. And the Romans don't want just a chunk, they want the whole thing. Minus a few recalcitrants, well that, that's inevitable. But they don't want three bishops taking a stand and the risk of two, a large part of the society following the three bishops as they then were against Bishop Foley. So don't you think, don't you think Rome is very happy with what they've done with this society? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. They're, they're, they're just laughing. And now they watch the society fighting and disintegrating. They're just laughing. They've achieved their purpose. Yeah. They, absolute, they, they absolutely wanted to stop the society raining on their parade. And they've done that. The society is no longer raining on their parade. And the frontier is now the, fr the frontier of the war for the faith, the fight for the faith. It's no longer between the SSBX and Concilia Rome. It's now between the small part of the SSBX that's, trying, that's resisting and the rest of the SSBX together with Concilia Rome. The fight now that the bulk of the society is spending much more time fighting the resistance than it is fighting the Concilia Church. <laughs> what does that tell you? Yes. Many of us here, Excellency, um, friends, family, you know, entrenched in organizations and activities within our local parish, in sure. our case here, St. Vincent. Sure. Um, Sunday, Father Violet read the latest statement of the remaining three on the occasion of the yes. anniversary. Um, after Mass, talking to some people, I don't know, this, this seemed to be the kind of continued suggestion, well, see, boom, where's everything's fixed, everything's back to where that's it was, it, that's blah, it. blah, blah, blah. Do you have a suggestion as to how to counter or what, what, how to deal with, what to say? It seems obvious to me that the people want to stick their head back in the sand. They want their nice, that's comfortable, it. pretty mask. They don't want to be messed with having to fight this fight. What do, uh, there might be fallout just from being here tonight, for example. Yes. What, what do you suggest or recommend? Any, yep. What do you think? Uh, firstly, nothing, can, not a word that comes out of Mensingham can be trusted. So they say, if, they, if Mensingham said that two and two are four, I'd begin to doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they're using Father's Blackberry. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, they're terrible. They say black and then they say white, and Bishop Foley, you know, Bishop Foley, one moment he says this, and then the next moment he says the exact opposite. And he, he speaks according to his audience. He doesn't say always the same thing. He's got one message for these people, and he's got another message for those people. I, re I remember in 01, 02, way back when all this started, yes. the, the, the pilgrimage to Rome and all yes, that. Yes, that's right. I, I remember him, I, from in the room this side, it was far away from here to yep. you. He said, we can't go back to uh, being in a Catholic zoo. That's and then it seems like he's kind of flip-flop. I, I mean, I, I heard him say, we can't do it. We have to stick to the doctrine. And boom, now he's saying, well, now we can talk to these guys. Look, he flip-flops. He flip-flops like, I don't know what, like I don't know what flip-flops, like a leaf <laughs> and on a tree. I mean, he, he's just one minute with the one way, one minute with one of the other. Is it, is it a malice on his part? Is it a naivete on his part? Is it a, is it a French? I don't know. God knows. Uh, it's, it's a little risky for us to try to judge, but he's got to know, he has to know what he's doing. You, if, if he, there are two alternatives. Either he, um, he says one thing and then he says completely the opposite. And he seems equally sincere each time he does it. It seems completely sincere. Okay. Either he is, is completely sincere, in which case his mind is just completely adrift. His mind is really adrift. If his mind is really adrift, then he can say anything, anything, one day and the next, and be sincere all the time. Because his, he can sincerely believe anything because his mind has got absolutely no anger. So if he's innocent, his mind is completely gone. If his mind is not completely gone, he's correspondingly guilty. 
if there's any sense of contradiction, any sense of truth that's left in him, he's, he's got to know what he's doing. He's a politician. He's essentially and primarily a politician. And he's playing a political game to get the trad cats in with Rome. For what purpose? God knows. Um, may some people naturally, one would think, a cardinal's hat. It may not be that. God knows, and I'm not saying it is that. It, it may be a real liberal conviction. It may be a real honest crusade for liberalism to get the trad cats to stop being anti-liberal and to make them liberal. And if only they will be liberal, then everybody will get together in a nice, cozy, liberal global world. Well, this whole Greg thing, that, that is, a yes. puzzle, that, that, is that an attempt to try to... It's almost like an attempt at American pluralism being forced yes. on traditional Catholicism. Yes. Yes, it's uh, a French diplomat. How many of you know about Greg or know a little about Greg? Not many of you are. Well, it was in 1995, a French diplomat who was the French ambassador to Italy for a few years, a French, this French diplomat, who was a, probably a devout Catholic, quote unquote, <laughs> said, we've got to put an end to this clash between Acon and Rome. Because Acon is Catholic. Rome is Catholic. How can they be clashing? We've got to solve the problem. He said, okay, now, the next thing he said was, doctrine won't do it. Because doctrine, when the moment they get together, they, they, start to, they start clashing on doctrine. So we've got to go around doctrine. We've got to go around doctrine. We've got to avoid doctrine. What we've got to do is apply diplomacy. He was a diplomat, so he thought of a diplomat. What we've got to do is to get everybody to sit down quietly together and love one another mm -hmm. and talk. And if only they will talk nicely to one another, then uh, we'll create an atmosphere which will finally lead to everybody embracing one another, forgetting doctrine. Then you got Vatican II and you got ecumenism. Yeah. Then you need ecumenism. Right? Exactly. Exactly. But that man, the group, he, he died soon after writing his charter, which was this, basically that idea. And then his widow picked up and she worked with a novice order priest, especially with a novice order priest, and with an SSPX priest. Now, the, the, novice, the three of them built Greg, which is a group of reflection be between Catholics. And this, like a little think tank, and, and cozy, a, a, a meeting, a cozy, a cozy meeting, so that there were monthly meetings, and then there would be a priest from the SSPX, and a priest from the, from the new church, and they would get together and they would have a supper probably and they would have a glass of wine and then they would talk and they would be nice to one another. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to solve the problem of the clash by everybody being nice. That's not how the Catholic Church works. It's not how the Catholic Church works. The Catholic Church runs on doctrine, not on being nice. But the modern world runs on being nice and not on doctrine. Because the modern world is liberal. But the, so, that the novice ordo priest, who's a, who's an aged priest, a decent man, well-meaning, well-intentioned. You you say all the nice things about him you like. That he goes along with this non-doctrinal solution. Okay, he's a novice ordo priest, but that the society priest goes along with it, and had the approval of Bishop Foley from the very start to go along with it, and kept Bishop Foley informed. And there were other society priests that regularly participated in these meetings. I mean, it's, this was 1997, 1998, 1999, through the early 2000s. And then the high point of Greg was when at last, from 2009 to 2011, four theologians of the society and four theologians of the society actually got down to talking to one another and discussing. Well, what happened when they got down to the, the, it? What became clear was the absolute doctrinal difference between the religion of modern Rome and the religion of, of, our, of the society, these four theologians were still clear in their mind. They were children of Archbishop of Fermi. And the clash was total and clear. I remember now, that. It was almost like it was a waste of time. Going in, yeah, of course it was. Going into the discussions, the society's position was, no, 
practical agreement without a doctrinal agreement. So we're going to sit down and we're going to talk. Talk, 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 talk. At the end of the discussion, since the clash is complete, since there's no possibility of doctrinal agreement, the, the, the principle suddenly becomes no doctrinal agreement, therefore a practical agreement, which is the exact opposite. And Bishop Foley announces this. There should have been an uproar in the society. What the blank are you doing? Changing what must have been the basis of our actual <coughs> views. Eh, we've got to obey. You've got to follow the superior. We are. The society priests are jerks. Excuse my French. I, I, no. <laughs> no. I've got no other way of putting it. They've, they've lost. They've lost the plot. What, what, would be, what was the point of what they're doing? Well, that's it. Become the fraternity. That's it. That's it. That's it. They've slidden into being more or less liberal. They've lost grip of doctrine which absolutely blocks any kind of communication with these miserable creatures in Rome. I can be kind to them, I can be charitable to them, I can be respectful, but I'm not going to talk turkey with these miserable apostates. How much of it is malice and how much of it is they've been fighting so long, they've gotten tired, they're just worn there's, out? I, I, <clears throat> there's a lot of that, tiredness. Yeah, I think there's a lot of that. Then also, they don't want to lose their cozy position, which you mentioned a few moments ago. They've got a rectory, they've got sisters maybe, they've got a little school, they've got their fellow priests, they've got their congregation, they've got their collections, everything is purring, mm -hmm. just like after Vatican, just like before Vatican II, mm -hmm. just the same. How many priests at Vatican II went along because they didn't want to face the alternative? And it was a few heroic priests who stood up and said no, and got thrown out. Trampled on by the bishop, they got thrown up, but they protected them. They, they, were faith, they stayed faithful. And that's what society priests have got to do today. They've got to say no to all of this nonsense and stay faithful, even if Bishop Foley and Mensing and then trampled upon them. That's the price, that's the fight for the faith. I suppose, I suppose before, you know, with, with vanity, to give the appearance of all this tradition. Yes. You know, is, that's right. Uh, now you've got this other guy who seems like a complete, I feel like, my friends look seem more of a buffoon than anything else. Yes, it seems right. easy to kind of retreat from their position and, and act all trad again. And, you know, but they've kind of but played the, their the, hand. The, no, 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 no. You see, the, Bishop Foley is a convinced liberal. What else can one say? By his actions, by his words, by his flip flops, <coughs> by his disguise, by his deceit, by his lying, he's a liberal. Because for him it isn't lying. It's just, he's absolutely sincere when he says anything that he says. His mind is gone. He's, he's completely unhooked from doctrine. He's a completely undoctrinal animal. And he's heading up the last fortress of Catholic doctrine. The last worldwide fortress of Catholic doctrine is headed up by a man who's lost all grip on doctrine. Unbelievable. But that's our poor age. That's our poor age. At the end of the fifth age, very few people have still got grip on doctrine and on truth. Very few people really still believe in truth. The minds are gone. The minds are shot. Yes. What about the other two bishops? They've gone along. For the moment, they're, they're going along. Now, almost certainly in private, they are doing what they can to block the slide of Bishop Foley. But they're playing footsie with him, and he's much cleverer at playing footsie than they are. They're too honest, comparatively speaking, to be good at footsie. He's completely dishonest, and therefore he's a marvelous at footsie. Is that honest? Yeah, yeah, and that's, that's kind of what the letter that you and the other two bishops sent to uh, Bishop Polite is, is like basically stayed with the doctor. Yes. And rebuke. Yes. But, but then what the difference is, the turning point was the general chapter of the month of July. Yeah. And the general chapter was another masterpiece of confusion by Bishop Foley. A masterpiece of confusion and manipulation. And men, good men with clear minds that went into the chapter, came out with their minds confused and they're all over the place again. 
Yes, like Vatican II. Yep. Um, be, behind. Yeah, I just had an observation to make when you were talking about um, that there is no agreement signed, but there is as if there is, because there like the letters that went out that, that told people you're not to associate with the you know, the websites or people who associate with the websites and, and there were, you know, punishments involved in that, but yet people can go to the fraternity, they can go to the no disorder, they can go to all of these things and everybody knows they are. And there's never a, a letter or a punishment sent out if, if you do that. Once again, exact parallel with Vatican II. Yeah. You can become Hindu, you can become Buddhist, we'll, throw, we'll give you our church, well, you can do what you like in our church, but traditional Catholic, no way. Exactly parallel. Again and again and again, the parallel, because it's the same melody. It's exactly the same melody. Just, just played on a slightly different keyboard a few years later. It's just the same thing, essentially. Yes? Your Excellency, uh, one observation. Uh, I go to the Fraternity of St. Peter's sometime. I've left the SSPX. And the, uh, just a comment on the local situation, about half of their members are frequenting the Fraternity uh, Parish now because services are not being provided at the local SSPX community. I went over there for the Mass of the Sacred Heart and the communion service was held. Uh, things like this are going on. So now they don't. The people over there, they're telling the people over there, the fraternity people, that there's no really no difference between the SSPX and the fraternity. Sure. And the church is air conditioned, and it's a lot more pleasant environment because it's all you know brand new inside. Sure. Uh, so that's one observation. The other question I have is, what's the chances of the other two bishops uh, going along outside of flight going along with your position? I mean, is there a chance at all? Or I mean, Tichier seems like he's got it so much together, what I've read about him and stuff, Bishop Tichier. I'd have to say his spine doesn't match his brain. <laughs> I'll, I'll put it another way, the engine purrs, but the clutch doesn't work. <laughs> So, you know, it, what, he, what goes on in his head doesn't go onto the wheels. What goes onto the wheels is the society, unity, superior, obedience to the superior, respect for the leader, uh, obey the captain. That's what drives his wheels. And so the doctrine is sort of disengaged and stays up in his head, and the feet go with Bishop Foley. I think that's the picture. Okay. I've known him very well. We've been, you know, buddies for years, or comrades in arms for years, for 40 years. I first met him in 1972. It must have been so. 90, that's 1973. That's 40 years. Mm -hmm. You know, I've known one another. So you know, um, Bishop Gallerator is a slightly different case. Bishop Gallerator is is a bit <coughs> too much of a politician. And he's, he's, he's trying, I think, to play footsie with Bishop Foley, and Bishop Foley will, be, will, will run rings around him, I think, every time. And Bishop Foley is now going, is, I'm, I'm willing to wager that Bishop Foley is not afraid of a reaction on the part of the two of them. Some people think that most of this latest declaration a good deal of it may have been written by Bishop uh, the Bishop uh, TC and Bishop Garrett because it looks traditional. So they may think that they've got Bishop Foley boxed in with this declaration. Bishop Foley will run rings around this declaration when he wants to. He'll do what he wants to. And and it seems as though the mass of SSPX priests and the bulk of SSPX laity will go along with Bishop Foley whatever he does. That's how it seems. Which is ridiculous. Ridiculous. The laity and the priests have lost their grip on doctrine. Mm -hmm. And that means losing their grip on reality, because the doctrine is simply the expression of the reality. They're living, they're, they've been infected by the modern la-la land, the great fantasy of the modern world, and they've lost their grip on Catholic realities. Really. And, and that's shown by their loss of grip of doctrine. Yes? Uh, I know you've had a lot of personal contact with Father Schmittberger over the years. Also. And, he, you know, 10, 15 years ago, he'd come to Kansas City and he'd talk and stuff. 
seemed like such a conservative Catholic, you know, he was just Solid. always bashing Vatican II. How, how does how does someone like that completely change around? Because his mind is floating on his feelings. Instead of the feelings floating on the mind, the mind is floating on the feelings. So one moment he's glamorized by Archbishop, and oh gosh, the, the kingship of Christ the King, everything the Archbishop has said, wonderful, because he's got the feeling of the Archbishop. Yeah. The Archbishop dies, and then he gets the feeling of Greg. And so the mind then moves together with the feel, with the new feelings. Is that I'm caricaturing, I'm exaggerating, obviously, but that I'm sure is basically the answer. And that's modern man. Modern man does not direct his feelings by his mind. The mind is floating on the feelings, so that if the feelings change, the mind flips all over, flips right over. There are not many modern men that think and go by what they think. They, the thinking is just, you know, it's, it's a pastime, it's a hobby, it's a nice thing to do. But it's got nothing to do with, it, it does not direct my life. And these, so many of the modern, so many of the sweetie pie priests of the SSPX are modern men. Especially the youngsters. I mean, I, I was born and bred, I'm, I finished my education in 1961. I wasn't Catholic. I was a lousy Protestant, which has been a great help ever since. <laughs> because I've never worshipped the Pope. I've never been tempted to worship the Pope. Which is why I'm not a saint of a cantist. Which is why I say it may be a help to be, be a lousy Protestant. Or a lousy liberal Protestant. That's me. That's what I mean. Uh, but um, the, the youngsters, the sweetie pie youngsters that have been through modern schools, and modern homes, which are often broken, you know, I mean, the, 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 mod, the whole modern environment, how do you expect them to understand reality? It's very difficult. They're, they're, they're sweetie pies, these youngsters, but they're into, they're into the dream, they're into the modern dream, and therefore they're into the modern dream Catholicism, which is either Vatican II or Bishop Foley. But they don't have a problem. They've never really, and, and I, I, you know, I drive some people crazy by saying, I drive Father Pfeiffer crazy, <coughs> by saying that I'm not sure at modern, you, I don't know how you could start today a modern seminary with modern young men. I don't know that there's the material there to make Catholic priests. Mm -hmm. Father says, in all due respect, Father says he's got some very fine candidates. <coughs> Please God he has. To start, he wants to start a seminary in October. I wish him all success. I wish him all success, Father. But I'm not sure that he's going to be able to find young men that got a real grip on reality. Modern young men that got a grip on reality. And if they haven't got a grip on reality, they can't have a grip on Catholic doctrine, which is real because it's real. Catholic doctrine is for real. They can learn it like you learn a te telephone book. You know, you can, you can. The, the boys. I've been a, I was a seminary rector for many years, and you know, you, I was always I was a seminary rector in the United States for 20 years, yeah. and I was always afraid of these dear young men coming in, sitting down on the bench, and they they look at you like that, and they've got a notebook and they've got a pencil, and you open your mouth and you say cheese is cheese, cheese is cheese, you know. <laughs> no. they, they just drink everything in, but you know that you're not getting there. You're getting here, but you know, that, that's got no, they, Their life is directed from their gut, not from the head. And therefore, when their gut flips, they're going to forget everything they learned, uh, th which they learned so well, which they learned so respectfully, which they learned so devoutly. It's a real problem with modern young men. And it's not only the United States. It's, it's everywhere now. Because the, the liberalism is everywhere. In modern, young Englishmen, it would be exactly the same. Young Frenchmen, even, it would be the same. France has, in, in theory, more. Th this, this problem is deep, deep, deep. And it's very difficult for a person today. It's not impossible for a person today to be a Catholic, but it's difficult. 
because the whole world is crazy. The answer, my answer is, it's impossible for God to abandon a soul that doesn't want first to abandon God. And therefore, God logically must have left all of us a sure means if we want of saving ourselves. And my very simple thought is that sure means, which is very simple, very practical, very available, is the rosary. Mm -hmm. I think if people pray the rosary faithfully and regularly, it is the best inoculation and immunization against the madness everywhere else. Mm -hmm. for, for years, and I'm not at all boasting, I'm not boasting, but I've prayed an average of 50 mysteries a day for the last maybe 20 to 30 years, or maybe 30, maybe even 30 years. That's not a boast. It's a gift. I'm sure, and I'm sure that's what's enabled me, a lousy Protestant liberal, to keep my head above water and stay with the faith that God gave me. I'm sure that Our Lady's, the grace comes from Our Lady to stay with reality, thanks to the rosary. I, that's my simple, simple answer. And it's typical of heaven that heaven would give a simple answer. The only thing, what I keep saying in sermons, I'm sure many of you have heard me, I keep saying, don't pray just five mysteries. If you're, if you're, unless you're a mother with ten children, and you know, you've got a ten-ring circus at home, uh, pray fifteen mysteries, because the age is so terrible. And if you don't pray them for yourself, pray them for others. Pray for others. Our Lady told the little children of Fatima, pray for sinners falling into hell because there's nobody to pray for. And the children, little children, remember the picture that Jacinda, that the terribly serious face of the little girl. She's doing tremendous penance. Our Lady had to slow them down on the verse because they had seen hell. They see, saw souls falling into hell. And Our Lady asked them to pray. And they prayed and did penance like Diddy her, until she had to slow them down, unless I mistake. The rosary is very powerful, and it's, it's, I mean, you and I have got to keep our heads clear, We've got to keep a grip on reality. We've got to find a way of doing it, and I, you certainly don't do it by reading the newspapers. <laughs> certainly not. But the rosary, yes. And you know, you, you and I can pray distractedly and badly, it doesn't matter. If my mind is not praying, the fingers are still praying. The mouth and the fingers are still praying. That's the marvelous thing about the rosary. It gives, it's the mind and the fingers and the mouth, which are the three most mobile parts of a human being, plus his feet. So if you pray the rosary walking up and down, you've got the four most mobile things involved. And, you know, that's the wisdom of the church. Our Lady gave the rosary back in the 1200s or 1100s to St. Dominic, and every saint since has prayed, praised the rosary. They've realized what a gift it is. It's so simple. Simple, simple, simple. But that's why, you know, that's why heaven gives it. But proud people won't pray the rosary. Oh. <coughs> but pride is the killer. Pride is what sends people to hell. I wanted to ask you about um, 